Good morning and welcome to Duck Church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together today. My name is uh, Pastor Chris and um, we are here to gather for the purpose of worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I have some clipboard opportunities and I've got one for each side so you don't have to pass it over. Um, one of the ministries here at Duck Church is called our care ministry and part of that involves providing food for those that are sick or those that are uh, struggling in a particular way for a period of time. Um, if you would like to help by providing a meal, you can sign your name and your contact and check under food. Also, another part of what we try to do to help in time of need is if you are available to drive someone to a doctor's appointment or um, a treatment or to the grocery store, that kind of thing, you can check under the drive section. And um, we would appreciate your service on that needed ministry here in the life of the church. <clears throat> so in your bulletin, um, there are a couple of things I just want to call your attention to. One, we will be having a combined worship service on the 29th, the fifth Sunday at 10 o'clock. And then afterwards, we will be having a lunch. We're going to provide the drinks, the fried chicken, the sides, dessert. Uh, it will be a great time to invite a friend or a neighbor to come and worship with you that day. We would ask that you would RSVP to the church office by the 25th so that we can ensure that we have plenty of food for everyone. Also in your bulletin, there is a, a little uh, insert about a Holy Land tour that is going to take place later this year, November the 6th through the 15th. Uh, there's information about uh, kind of the itinerary and and the price, and if you would like more information about that, I know it seems early, but there are a lot of things to get together between now and then. You can contact Judy Gregory right here in the choir. Her contact information is uh, there, phone and email, and she'll be glad to help you with any questions that you have. One more thing in your bulletin. It's a connection card, and it looks just like this one. And if you would take a moment to sign in on the front, it will help us get to know you a little better. And if you're with us for the first time today, and I know we've got some folks today, I, I met some friends from Greenville, and uh, they're here with us for the first time. We're, we're really glad that you're here. And if you would be so kind as to check the box on the left side that says first time guest, that would be great. Please complete as much information as you feel comfortable in sharing. Over on the back side, there are a number of next steps. Um, ha have you ever had a day where it seems like everybody wants a piece of you? You know, I mean, the demands sometimes get to be so overwhelming. You want to know a great antidote to feeling overwhelmed by this feeling? Um, remind yourself daily that you belong to God. In fact, recently I've started praying every morning, Jesus, I belong to you. I set my, I lift up my heart to you. I set my mind on you. I fix my eyes on you. I offer my body as a living sacrifice. Jesus, I belong to you. And if you'll do that, it'll kind of reset your perspective and help you to overcome that sense of being overwhelmed by the demands uh, in this world. So hang on to the connection card. We're going to deal with that a little bit more later in the service and give you an opportunity to finish things up. Our scripture today is Isaiah 43, 1 through 7, and the message is where to begin when you don't know where to begin. I, I remembered this past week um, uh, my social studies teacher, and uh, I had him to sign my, my yearbook in high school. And all, that was a lot of years ago, <laughs> a lot of years ago. And I still remember what he wrote. This is what he wrote. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Your attitude will determine your altitude. And like I said, it made an Im impression on me um, that I've carried it all these years. In my reading this past week, I came across something that Chuck Swindoll said about attitude. And he said this, we cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. 
The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. Look, everyone is welcome here in the Duck Church family where we have the opportunity week after week to adjust our attitude as we hear from God. So let's stand as we join together in the call to worship, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. The voice of God resounds upon the water. The Spirit of the Lord covers up the The Son of God is named Beloved. And all who worship shout out glory. Ascribe to the Lord majesty and strength. Let us worship God in holy splendor. And let's do that as we sing together number 469 in your hymnal. Jesus is all the world to me. Thank you. comforting thought to know that God loves us and calls each of us by name. Knowing that we are eternally forgiven and infinitely loved, let us boldly confess our sins before God. Would you join me in praying the prayer of confession found in your bulletin? Let us pray. We are precious in your sight, yet we often forget that we are your beloved. We confess that our love is fickle and inconsistent. We follow selfish goals and deny that our way of life harms others and hurts your world. We are sorry and we want to change. Create in us a clean heart. 
Strengthen our resolve. Reconcile us to another. And bless us with your peace. Amen. Beloved, God forgives your sins. Know that you are pardoned and be at peace to love the Lord and serve the world. come now to that portion in our service that we devote to the ministry of prayer. And as we prepare to go to God in prayer this morning, I'd like for us to lift up um, prayers for Marie Shelton. She's uh, getting over an illness. She's feeling better, uh, but she is not going to be able to be present for the prayer meeting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the chapel out back. But that does not prevent folks from gathering tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Um, and she ho hopes to be back on schedule the following week. We also want to lift up uh, special prayers for healing for Kathy Lucas. She was uh, taken to the hospital again yesterday, had a really bad uh, attack, and um, we, we pray for her healing and also for her family. And also I learned uh, this morning that Sandy Bergie is a little under the weather, and we want to pray for her healing as well. And uh, also special prayers of healing for Kathy Apple. Are there others that we should um, lift in prayer together today? Anyone else? Yes. Samantha Franco. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, John. Carrie and Daniel for continued healing from the flu. Carrie. Also, first, thanks for Scott for going overnight last night. Sure I say. Yes. When you said Daniel, it took me a minute to realize that was Dan the man. That's what I call him, Dan the man. Thank you. 
you, Alex and Ingrid. Anyone else? All right. Let's go before the Lord as we pray together today. Father, as you descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove, providing him sustenance and strength, we pray that you will do the same for us. Brood over us today as we offer our prayers to you. We pray for your church today. Not only our church, but all of our sister churches here on the Outer Banks and beyond. May your word spark our lives with truth and joy as we serve one another in the glory of your name. We pray for all leaders and people around the globe. May your justice provoke us to shape a peaceful world where all work for the common good. We pray for all of those who suffer grief or sickness of any kind, many whom we've named before you this day. May your tender presence abide with them and hasten their healing. We pray for all those who lack the essentials of life. May your righteousness raise us up to walk together with respect and dignity for all. We pray for all those who have died, that your steadfast love may shelter them in the peace of your eternal light. O oh God, you have made us, formed us, and called us by name, and you have redeemed us in Christ. Receive our prayers this day, for your life-giving spirit is powerful to save. And now, Heavenly Father, hear us as we pray with confidence, as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, there are many um, ministries and many ministry opportunities here at Duck Church. One of them that we want to highlight this morning um, is uh, on our screen. So let's just give our attention. Hi, I'm Brenda Sanders. I'm here today working for Food for Thought. And... I work with Duck Church and also with the Women's Club, and I feel like it's a privilege to be here to help feed people that that need it, and I feel like I'm so lucky to have food, and I want to give back. Come on out and help us out. <laughs> we've got today. We're going to pack 249. That's about what we've been doing. We're going to do two milks, two juices, one lasagna. I think it's in a little red can. Uh, one chicken, two puddings, two cereals, two apple sauces, two apples, and I think one of each of the snacks. Food insecurity is not something that escapes the Outer Banks. It is a reality here just like it is in many uh, places in our world. And uh, Food for Thought provides uh, much needed food for, for children. And uh, if you would like more information on how to serve, Brenda, the star of our video, is sitting in the choir and she would be glad to tell you how you could get involved in serving in that ministry. Let's stand as we sing together, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee, number 399.
your hymnals away, but before you're seated, would you turn and greet someone with the peace of Christ this morning? friends, I always feel a little guilty stopping all the fun, but let's join together in lifting our voices as one as we proclaim what we believe as followers of Jesus Christ. The Apostles' Creed is printed in your bulletin for your convenience. Let's join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Isaiah chapter 43 verses 1 through 7, I want to say that I believe with all my heart that this is the inspired word of God. And as we look today at where to begin where, when you don't know where to begin, let's see if we can apply God's word to our lives so that we might receive all the blessings that he has in store for us this morning. Listen for the word of God. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Being my, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, 
whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Would you pray with me? God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithfulness and obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How many of you remember the, um, the old show called The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross, right? It, it ran on uh, PBS. Man, that guy had some hair, didn't he? It, it ran on PBS in the 80s and 90s, and it was quite popular. I, I've never painted anything other than the walls of a room but I love to watch this show because it was so fascinating to see how Bob could start with a blank canvas and in less than 30 minutes present us with a beautiful masterpiece. And I use air quotes because I know he wasn't a Picasso, but um, he would paint paintings of a world where anyone would want to live. And that, in my book, qualifies at least to some extent as a masterpiece. Bob was the textbook definition of laid back. And I especially liked the way that he dealt with mistakes. He had a favorite saying, I know you know it, there are no mistakes in painting, only happy accidents. You know, if you accidentally splatter a big splotch of orange paint across the middle of a mountain scene, he would tell you not to throw away the canvas. Instead, he would show you how to incorporate that happy accident into your painting, how to work around it and keep on creating your masterpiece. In the same way, as you strive to make your life a masterpiece, you will experience many splotches and many accidents, though happy accident may not be the term you're inclined to use. There are times when things will happen that you didn't want to happen. When relationships unravel or you face a health crisis or financial troubles present themselves or problems at work, there will be times when things planned don't go as planned and things unplanned take their place. And maybe it was your own mistake, or maybe it was due to circumstances beyond your control, but there will be times where splotches appear on the canvas of your life that you never intended to be there. So when this happens, what should you do? Throw away the canvas? Give up? Forget about having a good life? It may sound tempting sometimes. It may sound like the only logical option sometimes. But there's a better way. You can learn to incorporate those unexpected splotches into the canvas of your life. It all comes down to your attitude. Now, last week we talked about the importance of living with a sense of perspective because your perspective shapes your attitude. Today I want to take this idea a little further and talk about how your attitude contributes just about more than anything else to the masterpiece quality of your life. Your attitude is the most powerful weapon in your arsenal. There will be times when it is the only resource that you have. But even then, when all you've got is the attitude you choose to adopt, you'll find that the right attitude is enough to get you through anything that life sends your way. Many times, uh, a splotch on your canvas um, happens, and we just can't get past, uh, past it because what we think that splotch means. We think... This splotch means I'm a terrible painter and I'll never be a good painter and I'll never finish this painting and this mess can never be made right and I, I may as well just give up. 
Now, if you've ever felt that way, I understand because I've felt that way. I've had more what's the use moments than I care to admit. And in those moments, the one thing that ultimately made a difference was the decision to choose my, what my attitude would be toward the situation and, and toward what had been splattered on the canvas of my life. Now, I think we've all been in situations where things have gone wrong. I'm talking to the right people, right? You've had things go wrong in your life, and we're really not sure what to do next. We've all been in situations where things have gone wrong and it appears that there's nothing that you can do to ever make the situation better. And it's in those moments that the first step toward recovery is getting a handle on your attitude, getting the right perspective about who you are and who God is and what this situation really means. The wrong attitude means that your way of dealing with the splotch is to give up, to quit trying, to stop painting altogether. The wrong attitude means that you just leave the splotch where it is and you do nothing whatsoever about it until it becomes the centerpiece of your canvas and it defines who you are as an artist. And then the right attitude, of course, is to see the splotch for what it is, an accident, happy or not, that may have even been caused by your own lack of skill or by circumstances beyond your control, but it can still be incorporated into the finished product of the masterpiece of your life. It all begins with your attitude. Now, in the book of Isaiah, we discover three promises that will help you to maintain your perspective when the circumstances of life overwhelm you. When you don't know what to do, when it seems like there's nothing you can do, but you want to begin again, but you have no idea where to begin, when you want to go on, but you just don't think that you can go on, these promises will provide a foundation for you that will clear, clear your head and sharpen your perspective and help you to see beyond the splotch that your life has become. I want to say that these promises go much deeper than just the level of emotion. These are not platitudes that you're trying to make yourself feel. These are promises that you decide regardless of how you feel and regardless of what circumstances may be telling you that you choose to believe these truths from the deepest part of who you are. So let's take another look at Isaiah 43. And here's the first promise to build your life on. You belong to God. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 tells us four things about how God views his relationship with his people. He says that it was God who created you. It was God who formed you. It was God who redeemed you. And it is God who calls you by name. In other words, you belong to God. And then in verse 2, God speaks directly through Isaiah saying, you are mine. You belong to God. You know, Jesus Christ came into this world and he died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And the Bible teaches that through Christ's death that we were bought and paid for. You belong to God. And God takes it seriously. God gave his only son so that you could be his. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that God's commitment to you is only as strong as your commitment to him. Because you may fail from time to time. Actually, more accurately, you will fail from time to time. You will sometimes have a hard time keeping your promises. Some days your heart will be cold and some days your faith will be weak. But God does not change his mind about us as often as we change our minds about him. As far as God is concerned, you belong to him and that will never change. Sometimes when we go through hard times, we're tempted to think, I'm, I'm just not a good Christian. I'm not a good person. I don't have great faith. Why should God help me? These are the times that you must remember what God says. 
You are mine. You belong to me. I want you to know when the things get splotchy in your life, God doesn't turn his back on you. God's commitment to you is infinitely greater than your commitment to him could ever be. And that's good news, isn't it? So if your life is looking like more of a mess than a masterpiece at this moment, I want you to remind yourself again and again, as many times as it takes, that you belong to God. He created you, he formed you, he redeemed you, and he calls you by name. Here's a second promise you can build your life on. God will protect you every step of the way. In August 1955, over a period of just a few days, 12 inches of rain was dumped on Putnam, Connecticut. Now, near Putnam, Connecticut is the Quinnebog River, which was contained at the time by an old um, earth and, and stone dams, and, and the rain just was too much for the dams, and one by one, they burst, causing tons of water to come crashing down through the town at speeds of 25 miles an hour. Bridges and roads were destroyed along with one-fourth of the town's businesses and homes. At one point, the water poured into a warehouse that was stocked with barrels of magnesium. As the magnesium came into contact with water, it ignited. The fire department and the rest of the town watched helplessly as barrels exploded, shooting flames 200 feet into the air. And the fire bombs landed on nearby buildings, causing the blaze to spread throughout the town. It was truly a disaster. The cost of the damage ran into the tens of millions of dollars and it took years to rebuild. In spite of all the damage done to this tiny New England town, not one person died during that storm. Putnam, Connecticut was consumed by flood and fire, yet everyone was saved. Notice what God promises us through the prophet Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And then down in verse 5, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Now Isaiah doesn't promise that you'll be saved from the fly fire or the flood. He promises that you'll be protected in the midst of it. He's saying you'll face circumstances beyond your control, but God will help you to get through them. You know, some people interpret the flood and the fire as evidence that God has abandoned them, but don't believe it. The fire and the flood are evidence that you are just like everyone else. It's just like Jesus said, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We all experience setbacks in life. And when it happens, we need to remember that God is not the source of our problems. He's the solution. God didn't create the misery in your life, but he'll help you to get through it. Viktor Frankl was a German psychiatrist who spent most of World War II as a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp. Years later, he wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he tells the story of how his six-year-old daughter once asked him why he always referred to God as the good Lord. He said, because he is good to us. Remember when you had measles a few weeks ago? He helped you get over them. His daughter said, Yes, but Daddy, don't forget, he was the one who gave me measles in the first place. <laughs> now, we laugh at that because that's a child's perspective. But if we're honest, it's also our perspective too sometimes. Instead of seeing God as the one who delivers us from the difficulties, we can't get past the idea that God was the one who dumped all of our trouble on us in the first place. Now, this kind of thinking will never work in your favor. It will never help you to get your life to be better. 
If you tell yourself that God is the source of all your troubles, then you're going to go through life being the ultimate victim. I mean, because who can win against God? But on the other hand, if you choose to believe the promises of Scripture, if you choose to understand that God didn't create the crisis, but he'll help you to conquer the crisis, then life's most difficult moments can be seen with a new perspective. So instead of seeing God as the source of your problems, and instead of blaming God for letting them happen, look to God for the strength you need to overcome each challenge you face. And then here's a third promise on which you can build your life. No problem you face can prevent you from reaching your potential. Do you know why God created you? Verse 7 tells us, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. This is your potential to glorify God, for people to look at your life and say, wow, God is so amazing. If God can do that in their life, I wonder what he could do in mine. Too often, we set our sights too low. We see our potential in terms of income or accumulation or career advancement. We work for a promotion, a little recognition, a little more money, a little more comfort. And God has so much more in store for you and me. God's plan is that you live the kind of life that shines a positive light on Jesus Christ for all the world to see. Dennis Byrd was a man with great potential. He was a professional football player, defensive end for the New York Jets, and an up-and-coming superstar predicted to help turn the Jets organization around. And then tragedy struck. On November the 29th, 1992, as the Jets were playing the Kansas City Chiefs, Dennis was about to sack the quarterback when he collided with a teammate and his spinal cord was snapped. In a split second, his football career ended. He was paralyzed from the neck down. All of his hopes and dreams came to a screeching halt. Later, he wrote about waking up in the middle of the night at Lenox Hospital in a halo brace, not knowing where he was, not knowing what in the world uh, was happening to him, not knowing why he couldn't move. In an instant, he went from dreaming of making the Pro Bowl to hoping that someday he could hold his daughter in his arms again. He was, according to the doctors, paralyzed for life. From the world's perspective, Dennis was no longer able to reach his potential, but in God's eyes, this man was capable of more than sacking quarterbacks. In God's eyes, Dennis Byrd is capable of giving him glory. And Dennis has done that in tremendous ways. The world watched and listened as he told the media that Christ Jesus, he used the word Jesus, was his source of comfort in his time of tragedy. The doctors announced publicly that Dennis may never walk again, that it would be years before they would know. Dennis announced publicly that with God's help, he would walk again soon. On the opening day of the 1993 football season, less than a year after the tragic collision, Millions of television viewers watched Dennis Byrd walk out to the middle of Meadowlands Stadium while 75,000 fans stood cheering. It was, without question, the highlight of the whole season. Well, that was 30 years ago. And today, Dennis continues to inspire people. He's able to walk, but with great difficulty. He has coached on the high school level and has spent most of his time traveling around the country telling his story. In one interview, he said, as a 46-year-old man, I don't know how you could really ask for, for what I have to be happy in all aspects of your life and still feel like it's on the upswing. What a blessing. Now, friends, the miracle of Dennis Byrd's life is not that he broke his neck and walked again. The miracle is that the injury that destroyed his career didn't destroy his life. God protected Dennis through the flood and the fire. 
Look, a, a, a financial setback might prevent you from becoming rich. Uh, an illness may prevent you from doing the work you love. A tragedy may prevent you from reaching some of your goals, but nothing can prevent you from reaching your potential in God because you were made to glorify God, which means simply that your life can demonstrate to the world how great God is. I mentioned Viktor Frankl earlier, the psychiatrist who lost his wife, his unborn child, and his elderly parents during the Second World War and who spent several years in a German concentration camp. In Man's Search for Meaning, he said this, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Look, there, there are circumstances you can't control. But you can always control what matters most of all, your attitude toward the events you face. You see, when you get knocked down, your attitude determines how long you stay down and how quickly you get back on your feet. It determines whether you allow yourself to be consumed by bitterness or whether you challenge yourself to become more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Life is full of all kinds of accidents. Some of them happy, many of them not. Every canvas here ends up with more than a few splotches on it. The question is, what will you do about it? How will you respond? When life goes wrong, your first response needs to be to take control of the one thing you can always control, your attitude. This is where you begin when you don't know where to begin. Take hold of your attitude. The promises that we looked at today will help you to do that. When you remember that you belong to God and that He will be with you every step of the way and that no circumstances can ever prevent you from fulfilling your potential in Him, your perspective changes and your attitude moves to where it needs to be. Friends, a a masterpiece of life is not a life without splotches on the canvas. It's a life in which the canvas owner, and that's you, has the courage to believe that God can overcome every setback and each mistake and therefore to give you the courage to go on. Thanks be to God that he is a God who loves us and who calls us by name. Amen. Friends, in just a moment, we're going to worship God through the offering this morning. So I'd like you to get your connection card back out and finish up anything that you need to. Um, you know, each and every one of us was made to glorify God. So give some thought this week as to how you can do that with your life. Also, if you're looking for a place to serve in the church, either short term or long term, please check that box and someone will be in touch to uh, share with you how you can do that. Now, if you're with us for the first time today, we're so glad that you've joined us. And we have a little gift for you. It's a little book called How Good is Good Enough. And it's all about how to know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day. And we want you to be sure about that. We don't want you to hope so or wish so or think so. We want you to know so. So all you need to do is drop your completed connection card in the offering plate when it's passed in just a moment. And then when you leave today, there's a table on the right side on the back wall that has several copies of the book. Please feel free to pick one up. If you need one for a friend, pick up two. Take it home, read it. It's our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us today. So as people who have passed through the waters of baptism, let us make our grateful offering to God our Redeemer.
Father, in grateful thanks for your love for us and that you call us by name, we return these gifts through your church. Bless them. Multiply them. And may they be used for your purposes to draw others to Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. And friends, let's remain standing as we join together in singing our closing hymn, which this morning is found on page 407, Close to Thee. weekend, be sure to come back next Sunday as we focus on 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, and the message will be discovering the Holy Spirit. I hope that you'll be here, and I hope that you'll invite a friend to come and worship with you. And now, let's receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who stood with sinners on the riverbank, uphold you. May the love of God who calls us beloved children, bless you. And may the power of the Holy Spirit, who descended upon Jesus as a dove, give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.